All right, I thought that maybe we should go over some of the most famous sex researchers and just to expose you to kind of the people that are known to have kind of built this field of what we're studying in this class is this class is the psychology of sexuality. And so I thought it might be nice to have uh, the basic researchers, the kind of key players establishing this. So let's go over this. So Richard Von Kraft Ebbing, he had, um, he wrote, wrote a book called Psychopathia Sexualis. Um, it had 238 case studies in it and he studied pretty much abnormal sexual behavior. So he was very conservative in his views of, of sexuality. So he believed that the only natural sexuality was uh, man and woman, very basic sexuality. But what, what he offered us was he started like actually um, systematically studying sexuality. And as you can imagine, um, even though he named the book Psychopathia Sexualis, um, he was doing that as a way to try to establish that it was scientific and discourage people from reading it. But as you can imagine, a lot of people wanted to read it. Like when you see 238 uh, case studies of kind of somewhat sexual deviance, probably you want to read it too, right? So he would... Uh, composed all these different case studies of individuals who had abnormal sexual behavior and um, his stance on it was that it it wasn't easily corrected so he said these is basically the what's happening and there's not much we can do to correct it and to be honest is paraphilias is what we would call these now so he gave uh, that's another thing is he coined a lot of terms that we use so he coined the term sadism he coined the term masochism and i think i already told you the stories of where those came from he also uh i believe that he coined the term fetishism uh, and so he said that basically these can't be fixed and kind of that's what we're finding now is if someone has a paraphilia, which is a sexual uh, kind of, it's kind of, uh, there's a big continuum called atypical sexual behavior. So atypical sexual behavior is, is kind of like a little bit different than what the standard population engages in but it's called a paraphilia when it causes the individual problems like they don't they like they feel deep set of shame of it or they're acting out or it's against the law or it's hurting someone else so if it's either hurting themselves where it's just causing a mental toll on themselves or it's hurting other people or it's against the law, then we would call it a paraphilia. But usually paraphilia is something that's like almost obsessive that they just can't stop and it's causing problems. So uh, it's very difficult to deal with paraphilias. They're very hard to get rid of. Uh, fetishism is common, sadism, masochism. So basically what a psychologist does in those cases is they're trying to like maybe reduce it or help them turn it into something that's more manageable. Okay, the next person that we'll talk about is Havlock Ellis and he's pretty cool. I like him because he, um, he had a very different view of sexuality than, than the other ones. And what I like about him is that he actually studied female sexuality and he made this statement which was very different than what Freud was saying, what Von Kraft Ebbing was saying, is he says that women's sex drive was equal to men, but that it was different. So he said that men's sexuality was more focused on the genitalia, whereas female sexuality was more broad in who they could respond to. Also, female sexuality was an all-over body, and it was uh, more diverse, their sexuality. And I, I think that kind of sums it up, is I think women are a little bit more fluid in their sexual orientation than men. Research has found that. And also, uh, we don't seem to be as genital-focused. We seem to be able to experience sexuality from, we, need, we seem to need more foreplay, we seem to uh, be able to uh, ex 
experience sexuality in a little bit of a different, less genital focused manner than men. Um, actually, here's a little sidelight about half black Ellis is actually, remember how I was talking about paraphilias and when I was talking about Von Kraft Ebbing? Well, actually, half black Ellis supposedly suffered, well, not suffered, but um, experienced urophilia. And what urophilia is, is urophilia is fascination with urination. So somebody who gets very sexually aroused by urination. And he explained that he developed this from his nanny was taking him for a walk when he was young and that's what we find with paraphilias is they usually start before we become adults. Uh, the beginnings of them can start like from three to five, that's Freud's uh, theory. But I also see that, that some of them can develop in adolescence. Uh, so he was in his uh, stroller with his nanny and um, he said that I guess she had to go to the bathroom really bad and so they stopped and she lifted her skirt and he saw the yellow trickle running and he said that that seemed to establish kind of a urophilia in him and where he had a fascination with urine. Another interesting fact about Havelock Ellis is supposedly his wife was a lesbian and so she engaged in, so even though they were married she ended up falling in love with another woman and they were, I guess they were on good terms, so he was able to kind of discuss a lot of female sexuality, and that's where he kind of came up with his theory. Uh, so, in any case, that's Havelock Ellis, as he wrote a big, I, I can't remember how many volumes it was, I want to say six volumes, and it was called The Journal of Sexuality, Psychology of Sexuality, like a six volume, um, books about sexuality, uh, and, but he had a different take on it. Okay, Magnus Hirchfield was the first homosexual activist, and they say that he became an activist because of this experience. The experience was that he was a psychologist, and he had a client that committed suicide on his wedding night because he was gay. Uh, and he couldn't face life like it, as a lie. And so Magnus Hirschfeld, he um, also contributed a lot to the journals and he, you know, was trying to, he wrote a pamphlet, I, I believe his pamphlet was Socrates and Sa Sappho, what is natural cannot be abnormal. And uh, as you know, Socrates was a famous philosopher and Sappho, where that comes from is, Supposedly, Sappho was this beautiful lesbian, and that's where we got the term lesbian from, from the island of Lesbos. So in the ancient Greeks, there was an island, and it was the island of Lesbos. And Sappho was this great poet, and she was beautiful, and supposedly a lot of women were there, and that's kind of where we got the term lesbian from. Okay, uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, ooh, this one... Maybe I should go into the whole thing, but I, I don't think so. But Freud, as many of you have been taught before, is he says that our primary instinct is sex and aggression because he believed in evolution. So what allowed humans to become a dominant species of the earth that we are is that our primary instincts are sex and aggression. So as you know, he says there's a part of us called the id, and the id is based on sex and aggression. And so the id is always trying to get what it wants, but then we have these other components of our personality that have to live in society, that we have morals, and they're kind of battling against the id. So he says, and I do want to say I, def I definitely see some of this, he says that our sexuality develops between the ages of three and six. And so what you're attracted to actually got set up between three, the ages of three and six. So if you guys remember about imprinting, um, we talked about that, that maybe the person, the people that you're attracted to, they have characteristics of your parents, maybe the same voice, maybe their hands look similar, maybe their mannerisms, maybe your parents had a beard. And so he talks about this because he says that after we're potty trained, our diapers come off and boys because he mostly wrote for men because remember during his time they believed that women did not have a sex drive so his theory is kind of more male oriented because 
in that time they didn't believe that we women had a sex drive except for Havelock Ellis he definitely believed that we did and it could have been because his wife was a lesbian so he saw that but in any case um, Freud said that once the diapers are off and the genitals are free the boys can start masturbating and when they start masturbating of course the person in his life that's giving him love is his uh, mother so he takes these sexual impulses and he puts it on his mother but then back in the Victorian age they believe spare the rod spoil the child a good parent disciplines their their children so the dad would come home and the little boy would want to like push dad out of the way and then the dad would be like no I'm home so therefore you children should be seen and not heard go away your mom is taking care of me so the little boy had the mom's attention all the time and then the dad comes home takes mom's attention so the little boy wants to kill dad Okay, that's the typical Oedipus complex. Fall, little boy falls in love with mom. Uh, kill dad. That's from a Greek play again. Um, Oedipus Rex was uh, told that he was going to fall in love with his mother and kill his father. And so he went away to try to not have this happen. But eventually it came to play anyway. So uh, Freud says that interruptions in this sexual time period is what causes all our paraphilias. And I will be showing you like some different uh, some different videos about paraphilias. Like par on the paraphilia one is I just kind of show you videos because I don't have good answers and so, so I think the best way that I can teach you is by just letting you experience what different people say about it. And a lot of them will say that it started in childhood, that there was really negative feelings. This is what I would advise you about raising kids, is I'm so glad that you're in this class because I hope that I'm opening your mind to like the different ways that people would express sexuality. In fact, this whole lecture, this whole sexuality lecture that I've been doing all week here is about looking at sexuality from a different point of view to so like, Stop making these negative judgments. Where are your negative judgments coming from? Let's look at it and let's like stand back and just kind of maybe accept people for what they are. So when you have kids, I hope that you try not to shame them because that's what Freud is saying. Is he saying that kind of it happens during this time and what they believe, now Freud didn't say this is more neuroscience, is what they believe is is early in childhood the brain is kind of structuring itself and so when you have a massive release of dopamine and what dopamine is from surprise or if I tell you not to do something taking a risk you know how I tell you don't do something and it makes you want to do it more so it's like what they believe is they believe it's like this merging in the brain between dopamine and high releases of epinephrine which is kind of the stress hormone. So that kind of seems to burn a groove. It doesn't really burn a groove, but it sets up a pathway that gets stronger over time. So when you're told you can't do this, you can't do this, but yet you got a rush from it, and so you kind of want to do it, um, it seems to set up this very strong pathway that's very difficult to break. Maybe you guys have experienced this. like. Um, have you ever found something that's like really terrible like but you can't not look at it like it's something that it's like so surprising so disgusting but it's like you want to look at it now let's pretend that you want to look at it but yet you're not allowed to look at it can you see that you would want to see it more so let's take well, like a really bizarre one. Let's take coprophilia. Why in the world would someone get a fascination with feces? So I can kind of give you a story about this. So a little boy, I'm going to tell you because I've raised a lot of boys, is the little boy, he, um, they can't wipe themselves. It's just common. And so they, they try to wipe themselves and then they can't and then the poop gets on them and then like, I don't know, the poop gets everywhere. So let's pretend that this happened. The mom comes in and she sees the poop and she is totally repulsed, repulsed. So first of all, when you wipe yourself and you're looking at your poop, well, I don't know, like maybe you guys still have to look and see what you made in the toilet. You know how that is, right? Sometimes, so anyway, a little boy is like, you know, it's like a dopamine. It's like, surprise, look what you made. Or like, hey, what's this? And then the mom comes in, oh my gosh, dirty, 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 nasty, nasty, nasty. What are you doing? Gross, gross, gross. 
And so now the boy, like, doesn't want to touch poop, doesn't want to look at it, but yet he does. If you guys are kind of getting my drift, I don't know if I'm getting this across. And so the child grows up, and now he has a fascination with poop. All because it was like such shame, shame, shame. You guys, I need to tell you something. Try not to shame people. Shame is this intense emotion. Okay, let me try another one because maybe that one didn't work for you. Maybe if I do three of these, you guys can like understand what I'm saying so I can get this across. Okay, so the little boy is, uh, we'll say four years old, and his, his sister, who's 16, is getting undressed, and she has boobs. She has different body parts than what he's used to. So he's going, and he was looking, peeping in the door, and he's like, wow, what's that? And as you can know, it's surprising. Remember, dopamine is released from surprise, unexpectedness. Oh my gosh, right? So dopamine is being released, but the mom comes up and sees him peeping, and she goes crazy because she's weird. She's scared that he's going to become some kind of pervert. Oh my gosh, dirty, dirty, oh, nasty. How could you do this? This, 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 this massive shame. And he released the, the adrenaline there, the adrenaline and the dopamine. It kind of sears this thing in his brain. And so what does he grow up to be? A peeping tom. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, exhibitionism. This is actually the number one paraphilia. Did you guys know that? Like, um, as far the illegal paraphilias, the most, the number one sexual arrest, uh, is actually uh, exhibitionism. Pretty interesting. Uh, and once they're an exhibitionist, this is what I'm trying to tell you: is it's very difficult to get rid of that. They just repeat it. They just go back and do it again. It's it's hard to get rid of a fetish. It's like, it's like kind of like this. Can I take this as an extreme? Like, what if I told you whatever you're attracted to, what if I told you you can't be attracted to that? Like, so let's say that you're attracted to a certain race. Maybe you find um, Hispanics super, super attractive. And then you're told, you can never like them. Can you see how that would make it worse? It's like, right, right, right. Okay. So anyway, let's do exhibitionism. Okay. So little kids, they like to get out of the bathtub and they like to run around naked. They just do. I don't know why. We got to be kind of relaxed with the sexuality thing. But anyway, this mom was one of those uptight moms. And I'm not blaming everything on moms. But back in Sigmund Freud's day, the moms raised the kids. So everything I blaze, blamed on moms. The dads were just off at work. They just came home and the moms took care of them. So, okay. All right, so the little kid gets out of the bathtub. The mom didn't know it got out of the bathtub. And so it ran through the living room, and she was entertaining guests. And she was, and the guest, when they saw the little kid run through, this was back, like, kind of Victorian age or something, they started laughing. Ah, laugh, 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 laugh. Oh, my gosh. You know, shock, laugh. And then the mom just shame, 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 terrible, terrible, terrible. And you know what you find with exhibitionists? Is you find just that, is what they want. Like if you were to turn to an exhibitionist and say, mm, that's looking pretty good, let's go. No, they would, they would probably run away. What they're looking for is they're looking for your shocked reaction. And actually what they do is they go behind the bush a lot of times or they imagine later your shocked reaction. They go for people that are going to be shocked. That's what turns them on. Okay, well, hopefully um, I've kind of given you some insight about Freud's theory and sexuality. As he says that our sexuality develops between the ages of three and six. Um, he doesn't talk as much about females uh, because they didn't, they believe something different. But it's, it's something interesting. Okay, I feel like this uh, lecture is getting super long. So maybe uh, I'll try to do, uh, maybe I should stop here and then we can do Kinsey and Master and Johnson next.